Good evening and uh, welcome to this special election event with the Ian uh, Hubel. I'm Sarah Churchwell, Chair of Public Understanding of the Humanities at the University of London School of Advanced Study. Please note that the chat function is closed for this event, but we will be having a Q&A later with Bonnie. For this, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, there should be a little icon for this in your toolbar. Please be aware that this event is being recorded, including the Q&A session. Please note that any question you ask and the answer will form part of the recording that will subsequently be made available online. You can ask your question anonymously by ticking the anonymized box before submitting a question. This event is part of the Being Human Festival of the Humanities, which is taking place across the UK between the 12th today and the 22nd of November. Today is our official launch day and events have already been taking place all over the country. Being Human is the UK's national festival of the humanities, run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. For obvious reasons, events are mostly online this year, but they are locally generated in 55 towns and cities across the UK. And you can see the full program online on the Being Human Festival website. If you want to tweet about tonight's event or the festival in general, you can find us at Being Human Fest and please use tag in 2020. So tonight I'm delighted to be joined by the great Bonnie Greer, uh, who is one of our festival patrons. Bonnie Greer, OBE, is an American British playwright, novelist, critic, and broadcaster. Her podcast, in Search of Black History, which was produced by Audible UK, went number one on both sides of the Atlantic recently. She regularly appears as a panelist on television programs, including the late lamented Newsnight Review, which is how she and I met some years ago now, um, and Question Time, when many of us uh, will remember the great moment when she turned her back on Nick Griffin of the National Front, which really was like my favorite moment of television. Um, Bonnie has served on the boards of several leading arts organizations, including the British Museum, the Royal Opera House, and the London Film School. Currently, she's working with the British Museum to create a project called The Era of Reclamation with director Hardwick Fisher, which is an exploration of how we might go about expanding a museum to make it a place of discussion, encounter, and conflict. She began, she and, and uh, um, Hardwick Fisher began planning this uh, with the Black British community and the Black European community in 2019. And they launched in 2020, uh, just before uh, lockdown, but also just before the BLM movements of the summer. Um, and they've recently resumed online on the museum's digital channel where you can find those conversations. Bonnie is also the chancellor of Kingston University. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bonnie. I used to, I used to be the chancellor. <laughs> not oh, anymore, you're not the ex the former, former chancellor. Yeah, I'm the ex-chancellor, right? Oh, well. Good so evening. Once, 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 once in future chancellor or I something was, like that, yes. I'm sure, I'm yes. sure. Yes. Um, Good evening. Good so to much. see you. Good nice to see you. To see you. Um, so we decided You didn't that mention we, that we're both Chicago girls, did you? Not yet. I'm going to get to oh, that. Oh, oh, but okay. Indeed. No, it's okay. It wasn't a surprise. It's not a big reveal or anything. I'm right. <laughs> okay. Um, but exactly. But so that's it. And so one, um, we thought, Bonnie and I thought when we talked about doing this event that we would um, do something a little bit unusual and not just do a kind of standard Q&A where I'm interviewing Bonnie um, because we're friends, um, because we're both from Chicago, because we already know a lot about what we both think about these um, issues that we're going to talk about. Um, and we thought it might be more enjoyable and also a little bit more unusual to just have something that's more like a dialogue. Um, so, um, and also you can't really stop us from having a dialogue, can you, yeah, Bonnie? I mean, See, that's the main we're, thing. We're just gonna do it anyway. So, exactly. you know, it's like trying to fight the tide. Um, <laughs> or so, Lake Michigan. <laughs> there you go, perfect. <laughs> um, so I do have some um, like bullet points and a few questions to kick us off just so that we don't just, you know, start rambling and putting the world to rights, which is what we normally do. Um, so, and we haven't actually caught up since the election because we've been keeping this, uh, um, uh, you know, keeping our powder dry, I guess. So my first True. question is, did you stay up all night for three nights 
Um, or yes. did you like a normal person or did you sleep? <laughs> no, no, I didn't have any sleep. In fact, Sarah, I was up almost two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I can remember Florida when Hillary, when they called yeah. Florida in 2016. And you know, the expression, turn your face to the wall. So that was it. Then I went to sleep, but I thought, no, not again. I, I wanted to witness this. So no, I was up, 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 still yeah. up, still up. Yeah, <laughs> you haven't slept since still then, have up. you? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So Madness. now look, there's a there's a lot to talk about, and I've got some some notes here just to try to get us to cover some cover some ground. But yes. um, I want to start with some upbeat stuff because there's a lot to be worried about, but there's also a lot um, to celebrate. And I think, although everybody's talking about celebrating Biden and about celebrating the removal of Trump, and I know that you and I are both agreed that those are both things worth celebrating. Um, but here we are, two women. Um, as we said, both from Chicago, both feminists, both opposed to patriarchy. And we are looking at the election of the first woman and the first black American woman and the first Indian American woman and the first mixed race woman all at once to the second highest office of the land. And I just wondered if you wanted to say something about what that means to you as an African American woman. Um, and also I was curious about whether for you it was was it was it like Obama's win? Was it more emotional, less emotional, just weird because the last four years? Or like, how does it compare in terms of it as a transformational moment um, for you? Well, you know, first of all, I, I thought of my dad, you know, who was in this country as a young man. He turned, he turned 20 the day uh, after D-Day. He was stationed here and he was working and he was in a segregated army. It was literally segregated, the American army. Um, he came out of a, uh, he was trained in a, in, a, in a fort that was named after a Confederate general. And he lived in Mississippi where he couldn't vote. And he came here and he always, he was stationed here and he went over to Europe. Wasn't even armed until he, he got over into Europe. And, and I thought of him because he always taught us um, black history, taught us about his own life. And so the moment Barack Obama came down the stairs at Air Force One, I guess it was in 2008, I guess Bush had let him have Air Force One. I, I, I just burst into tears. I just, I just wish he, my dad had been with me to see this man. And then to see uh, Kamala Harris, Senator Harris, uh, Vice President-elect Harris. Um, that's an even deeper moment in a way because um, she is not only uh, things you say, she is the first African-American, the first Indian-American, the first graduate of, his, of an historic black college, the first vice president to have a male spouse, the first vice president to have a male uh, a spouse who is Jewish, mm. Um, all of these things that she's done, but to think of, if I'd seen her when I was a little girl growing up, I think my life would have been different. Um, you know, you look at all the lists of vice presidents all the way from the beginning, and there she is, and just bam. Um, so it's, and, and you also know the other thing too, Sarah, um, Joe chose her because she's gonna be the co-president. I mean, I, I think that's just what's gonna happen. She's gonna be, he said to Barack, the only thing I ask of you is that I'm the last person in the room. I'm the last person. And she'll be the last person in the room with him. And so all of that is enormous to see, enormous. Yeah. I feel so, I feel so happy because there's a generation of kids growing up for whom Barack Obama was president of the United States, like, what's the big deal? I mean, what was the deal? And there's going to be a generation of kids growing up that Kamala Harris and somebody like her is going to be like, what's the big deal? Yeah, and that's absolutely. Great. And it's going to connect, as you say, to the kids who grew up with the Obama White House. That's going to be the exactly. continuity. Exactly. That's like nothing. Yes. That establishes yes. the normal and Trump becomes the aberration. If exactly. we can keep him out, we'll talk about exactly. that. Exactly. Um, exactly. Um, yeah, no, and also, of course, Biden saying that he wanted, that he views himself as a transitional president. I mean, I think that was important for a lot of people 
um, you know, it was seen as a political statement because he was, you know, some people said, oh, he's placating the progressive wing, but it's also about his age and that, you know, all of the ways in which he talks to young people that he's saying, this is for you and this is your generation. And I think he genuinely does see himself as a transition and Kamala is clearly what he is transitioning She's clearly to. what's coming, you know, um, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and it's powerful message because Joe's generation has lived a long time. I mean, we humans don't only, I guess the last 50, 60, 70 years of humans lived as long. And so, and, and been as vital, been able actually to function. And, and Joe is sort of the beginning of that trend. We are going to live a lot longer. We're gonna be a lot more active longer. But Joe, he's been in Washington for 50 years or a thousand, I don't even know. And he, he's aware of history. He's aware of the fact that the United States, like the United Kingdom, like the world, is becoming majority minority, and that he represent the, represents the end of something. And if he can actually contribute to the beginning of something in that ending, he's very, he's acutely aware of, of this moment in history. And that's very moving because We've had the last four years of someone who wasn't. So it's it's just very, very moving that that he's aware of where he stands in history. And he's embracing it, right? He's not resisting it. That we also had four no. years of somebody resisting history, trying mm. to, to make history what he wants it to be, to bend to his will. And here's exactly. Biden saying, I can see what's coming and I'm and I'm cool with it. I'm great with it. Let's do it like this. And it's really but, nice to see. But you know, you know, this to, to say um in a sense, and I think it's is a lot of things that people who are not American don't know. Biden embracing history and Trump refusing history is American. That's exactly the way America is. I mean, in America, if you're old enough and you're born in America or you're soil born, soil born, I have no idea what that means, but anyway, you can be president of the United States. I mean, you can be sweeping streets and if you decide I want to try and be the president of the United States, you can. And if you want to, turn history around or look at it another way, you can. Um, and so that's what Trump and Biden represent the other side of that. And I think a diminishing aspect of America as America begins to realize, I think, that there's a part of us that has to grow up. I mean, we America's still a very young country in terms of this great experiment that you talked about in your, your your wonderful book, Behold America. I mean, it's America's experiment. People don't get that. Um, and the experiment of America happens every time there is a presidential election. Donald Trump is an aspect of the experiment of America. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are an aspect of the experiment of America. And I think we are now, because we, we're, in a, we're in this digital age and this social media age, we don't, uh, we don't realize that, but, but America's an experiment and it fails every time and it wins every time. Exactly. It's very much a work in progress, right? It Absolutely. really is. I mean, it all is. Con it is. All it countries is. are. All countries are, but because I think America is such a story that we tell ourselves, it's a story that has to keep being revised. And it has different authors and different voices. And this is that right now we're in one of the periodic almighty Stories. clashes that we have over who gets to tell the story. Exactly. Everybody who loves Hamilton knows that there's a reason why Lin-Manuel Miranda puts that in the musical, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. It's about controlling the narrative. It's That's all. what it's about. And it's, it's, the know, it's the story, it's the story. Exactly. And it, right now we're having these two versions that are, and again, it's an almighty tussle and it happens every now and then. And this is another one of the moments where it's happening. The biggest, mo you know, are you like me? I'm sure we'll have had lots of people asking you, is is this the most divided America's ever been? And I'm like, no, no was a civil we had a war. civil war, hello. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come on people. No, you know, no. so um, so look, so we're we're I think clearly both in a in a hopeful and positive frame of mind, but um. Uh, all of our uh, listeners, I'm sure viewers, uh, will be acutely aware that although we are talking about Biden and Kamala Harris as president and vice president elect, um, we are in a, an unusual situation, unprecedented in modern times, I think in American history, where um, 
the uh, um, duly uh, uh, elected president and the, and the president has lost, who has refused to concede and to admit that he has lost. Now, obviously, a lot of people are deeply concerned about that, and I'm, and I'm concerned about a lot of what's happening. Um, but I think that for our, our uh, viewers and, and listeners, we need to kind of be clear about where we stand on this. I am very worried about what's happening, but I also think that Biden and Harris are going to be inaugurated on January 20th, 2021, the way that they are supposed to be. Is that your view or do you think this garbage can gain traction? Obviously it can, there's a non-zero chance that it can gain traction. But uh, my personal view is that the odds are that we're going to get where we need to be. But I don't know if you agree with that. I, I, I mean, first of all, I wasn't, you know, and I, I know you know this, but I want to say to people who are looking at us, Partly this is American doom humor. I mean, we I wasn't like laughing because I think, oh, I'll we'll be all right. No, but mm -hmm. it I, I want to reassure people that this is America. This is an, an aberration. I mean, Donald Trump didn't create this. This is the United States. This is the way it is inside of itself. It's a very turbulent country, a very volatile country. It's a young country. It's an experimental country. All sorts of people have come together and been dragged in and stolen and everything else to make this thing. And it's always building itself every day. What worries me um, is that Donald Trump has destroyed the norms. And that, that's happened in this country as well. We as Americans are brought up to believe certain things. And no matter where you are on the political spectrum, we think these things will happen, i.e. when it looks like the president's got a lot of votes and the media usually calls it, AP calls it, AP's been calling the president since 1840 something. So Americans accept that as a norm. AP called Joe Biden, that's the president. He's the president. Uh, so that's a norm. Uh, there's a norm that then the transition begins where the, the, the offices of state are opened up so that the president, incoming president, can begin to do what he's going to do and get together. He gets his intelligence briefings so that on the day of inauguration, th there's a smooth, they call peaceful transition of power so that the country isn't exposed. And they, they say that uh, partly 9-11 um, happened uh, because there was a disruption in the Bush Clinton handover, uh, because of the problem with the vote between Gore and Bush, there was this tiny little sort of break in command. And they think that Al Qaeda found it. it you know, the, these, these things can happen. Yeah. So the worry for me is, uh, and he is decapitating the Department of Defense, yeah. uh, which is really what the Department of Defense is calling it, a decapitation. He's mm -hmm. taking people out and putting his own people in. We don't know what that means. So we don't know. I mean, the president-elect is not being allowed to get his goodwill me uh, messages from the State Department. We don't know what that means. The person who signs off to allow the money to flow for the transition offices for various things to be opened has refused to do that. We've never been here before. Absolutely. We don't know what that means. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely, and I and I like you. I don't want to underplay the damage yeah, of, of yeah. what's being done right now, and and all of the things that you said. And then there are also the dorm uh, damage to the um to the, to the to the the trust in the democratic process itself, which not just Trump, but the Republicans are merrily burning. I mean, they are burning them in front of our eyes. So there was a poll today that came out that said that 86% of Trump voters say that Biden did not win the election legitimately. 73% say they'll never know the real outcome of the election. 89% of Trump voters think he should contest the outcome of the election. 62% of his voters think it will change the outcome of the election. I mean, that is just a horrifying set of statistics about the breakdown in trust and, of course, in that shared common ground of factuality which we've seen being broken down by the different media spheres and by the collapse of local news over the last 10 years or so. But, but let me go back a little bit because again, this is not to reassure anyone, but to, but to talk about America. Uh, the Western genre, Westerns, are really the story of disgruntled Confederate soldiers and generals who thought they were going to go to a blank space, which was the West. And they, they took with them the idea of, of uh, the noble cause, 
which was the Confederacy, the cause for freedom from the federal government. They took that and turned it into the Western hero. So you get these Westerns, which at their root are about the breakup of the United States of America and the recreation of a kind of America that these individuals believed in. And we all sort of buy into the Western hero, but that's where it began. And, and so this sort of idea of I'll never accept the result, it's always been America. The problem for these people is there's no West to go to. They can't pack up and go anywhere and take other people's lands and whatever. Mm. It's nowhere to go. Yeah. So, so the pro the problem is, you know, how do you how do you how do you work and how do you understand that? Yeah. I mean, now they're blustering. Some of them are blustering. You'll have seen this about seceding again um, and misspelling it, calling it succeeding, um, which right. is different. Um, so the um, absolutely, and I and I think that the the importance of the way that American that Trump has. Um, both performed and weaponized key American mythologies is really, really, really important to his success. And as somebody who studies narrative and cultural history, like you do, I'm very um, um, aware of the fact that that I think is a really underexplored aspect of his power um, and his appeal totally. to his key audience. Totally. The way that he performs this kind of American masculine patriarchal swagger, the way that he performs this kind of you know successful businessman, and how much people, how many Americans really buy into that. And this Calvinist myth that um, if you're rich, it proves that God loves you more, which of course is not what Calvin said, but it's how it's come through into American society. And so all of these kinds of key American myths um, that for his supporters, he seems to just embody and to make true. Now for his critics, um, and for those of us who kind of look behind the curtain of the Wizard of Oz, we see the tawdry showman who's the carnival huckster, who's just pulling the levers. Um, and it's clear that he's not rich and he's not rugged and he's not strong and he's not self-made and he's, and he's, you know, full of garbage and all of that stuff. But he is animating and weaponizing these really familiar and deep, um, deeply held American stories, in my view. You know, I, I agree. And I, in 2016, the last play that I had produced was called The Hotel Cerise. And it was a retelling of, of Chekhov's great play, The Cherry Orchard. And it takes place in an African-American resort uh, in upstate Michigan. And one of the characters says on the stage that Donald Trump will win the election. <clears throat> I was appalled. Um, because, you know, of course, as a, as a playwright, you want the play to take over at some point. You want the play to take over. And I really tried to get that line out of the play. And then I was told by the directors, well, the actors have already created their business around it. You can't take the line out. So every night, six nights a week, my play said, Donald Trump will win the 2016 election. So I've looked back at that play to try to understand how it happened. I mean, first of all, he won Michigan, and that's where the play takes place. But to go back to your point about performance, the character in my play understood the performance of Donald Trump, understood the performance of masculinity, which, by the way, attracts a lot of African-American men and a lot of Latinx men, you know, and he's, he doesn't do as badly as people think in that demographic. And a lot of it has to do with his performance of masculinity. And it's always been an American trope, as you say, always has. And also the other trope he performs, which you, you nailed so beautifully in your book, and you talk about Gatsby. Gatsby is an aspect of that trope as well, that Trump performs. He performs it uh, with humor, and he also performs it with menace. And that's what he's performing now. He's performing the guy gangster. Gatsby got his 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 yeah. his start Absolutely, from. yeah, yeah. The gangster and the thug and all of that mm, stuff. Mm, Absolutely. Mm, mm. But I also think you know I think that we underestimate how important his kids are to those tropes as well because it's patriarchal too. You know the sense that you know that, that and again it's deeply constructed this idea that he's devoted to his family and his kids are there representing him. But so there's the sense of a dynasty being created, and that and again it just taps into something unconscious, right? It's not that it's not that Absolutely. everybody's aware of this or doing it deliberately, but it works. That's why the pieces come together and they work emotionally. Um, 
for his supporters. Now, speaking of toxic masculinity, as we are, um, reminds me of, and I'm, this is gonna come back around to Trump um, and indeed to the polls um, and to what you just said about him performing well with African-American men and with um, Latinx men. Um, but I wanna remind you, and this is also then gonna um, hopefully bring our um, personal story into this as well. Because I wanna remind you of a moment that I remember really, really well. Um, I was in a hotel room somewhere, I have no idea where, somewhere in Britain, some random hotel room, and I had just given a talk, and it was the night of the Kavanaugh hearings, and I was alone in this hotel room, and I was watching it on my laptop, and I was, you know, and I was, you know, conversing with people on Twitter, and you were one of the people that I ended up talking about with it, and I don't know how you all you remember it, I remember it really, really clearly, because it was so triggering for me, um, yes. like so many women, the Kavanaugh hearing was unbelievably triggering. I know it was for you too. I wasn't suggesting otherwise. But no, that's no, no. But I know what you're about to say. I head. know where you're going. Yeah, yeah I know where you're and going. So, yeah. And so I was so upset. And it was clear that it was these white suburban women who were carrying him over the line. And you said to me, and I think at some point we actually even went off Twitter and we were doing it on private messaging, like private channels. But I remember clearly you saying to me, Sarah, you're going to have to give up on white suburban women. And I was like, Bonnie, I can't give up on white suburban women. I am a white suburban woman. And all of my family are white suburban women. And I should say my family, my the women in my family are not shy Trump voters. They hate him as much as I do. And they've been out getting out the vote and trying to stop him. So I'm not going to give up on white suburban women. Um, because I know that they're not a lost cause. But Sarah, you're deeper than that. You're deeper than that. You may flower. Mm -hmm. See, and this is this is very, very important uh, for for people to understand what I'm saying. Um, you know, in America, we wouldn't do that here, but in America, we have demographics that we name like white suburban women because that shows how divided the country is. People don't live next to each other. So um, uh, white suburban women is a type. I mean, there are black women who are in white suburban women and Asian women who are in white suburban women, but it's it's a demographic who have certain uh, uh, things that they want, where they live. I mean, Trump called them housewives, which is probably why he lost them. Um, so... Uh, it's a particular kind of of where you live, how you grow up, where you go to school, how much money you have, what you expect from life. And I point out that Sarah is, is Mayflower as well. So that's a double thing. Uh, that, that Those are Mayflower, are the people who landed in Plymouth Rock and the people we, we are taught. I mean, they are the aristocrats of America. If there are any aristocrats, it is Mayflower. Clint Eastwood is Mayflower too, I may add. Oh, so I'm really sorry to this, hear that. Yeah, well, I mean, he there, is. There so, are actually millions of us. You know, you know, they had like, you know, most of them had like 88 grandchildren and 10,000 great Exactly, but I'm not saying it's a special, <laughs> it's a special idea of America. Again, a symbolic, place. it's a symbolic idea. Yeah, it is. It's very special. So um, I, uh, white, and, and this goes into our story as well. I mean, in, and white suburban women is a particular demographic. And, Trump, they, they turned their back on him in 2018. I'm very proud of them. They turned their back on him and they turned their back on him this year yeah. as well, because really, there's an idea been, yeah. that demographic about what America is. And they believe that it's a decent place and it's a place of tolerance and they couldn't take it anymore, basically. Yeah. They just couldn't take it. I think that's it. absolutely right. They couldn't take it. And um, the, the numbers are still uncertain, as you know, um, but the latest AP um, exit poll that I saw um, showed that he carried, uh, uh, Biden carried white women with a college degree by 20 points. Um, so that was actually um, his biggest margin. Um, now we'll have to see if those numbers hold up, but that's the, the preliminary numbers. And it's certainly, I bet I could like, breathe a sigh of relief. And, um, they couldn't take it anymore. It was too I much. Know, I know. So Bonnie, so you should tell the story because I think, I think people will be interested and in it goes to the point about the symbolic identity. So if my identity is symbolic as this kind of like Mayflower and, um, and that kind of affluent white privilege, um, which is a generational privilege and it is. Exactly. Um, then, um, and so I'll just give a very, very brief thing about mine. And then, so my family came to um, the Chicago area in the uh, late 1800s and um, they lived on the South side, um, Hyde Park, which is um, for those who are watching this, um, is where the University of Chicago is. Um, my grandparents got married at the University of Chicago Chapel um, and they lived there uh, for most of their young married life. 
And then when they had my mother and my aunt, they moved to the northern suburbs of Chicago in the mid, uh, well, like the late 40s or mid 50s or early 50s rather. So around then. Now, um, as Bonnie is well aware, this was a time um, in the 50s uh, in America that was characterized by a demographic shift uh, that became known as white flight which was um, affluent white people leaving um, city neighborhoods for the suburbs. Um, and there were various reasons why they said that they did this, it had a lot to do with schools, um, and, but it was also to do with property value and it was deeply racially inflected. So it was as, um, as post, or particularly post GI um, uh, soldiers who were getting onto the housing ladder thanks to the loans from the federal government. They were buying up and moving into historically white neighborhoods and then the white people left and it became known as white flight. Now, that's not to say that those um, individuals were necessarily racially motivated as such. Um, my grandparents were not racist, I knew them um, and they were not, but they were part of this demograph demographic shift. So they also took part in a racist pattern even if they were not personally motivated by racism as such. So they upheld racist structures in that movement without that being their intention. So I was always aware of this. And then, and then Bonnie and I met, I discovered that Bonnie is from Hyde Park, Chicago. So I will now hand over to you and you need to tell your part of the story. Okay. I was born at the end of the 40s. Um, and my dad was one of the uh, GI who was able to get a little bit of money eventually to buy his own property in a community where white people had left. And that was on the west side. And then he bought a house on the south side um, uh, where white people had left. In fact, I can remember uh, being in our house and you know white guys driving past, you know, making noises and stuff at us and having to, we were sent to the white school to desegregate it. And we were told this is about the beginning of the 60s. And we were told, when I was in, in uh, grade school, we were told uh, in the winter, they showed us the tracks that the, the trucks had made, black kids were already there. And they said, after school, make sure you get in that track because that's the best way to run home because that was the tracks that the, the trucks had left because we were bombarded with snowballs, with rocks, and it was horrible. Um, and I grew up in what's, what used to be called the ghetto. It wasn't, it was the black community. We had a lovely house and I'm some, some uh, distance south of, uh, of, um, of Hyde Park and, and, and uh, west, closer to where Barack Obama began his, his sort of community organizing career. Um, actually the neighborhood that Sarah's uh, family was in is a neighborhood Michelle Obama was born in and grew up in. By that time it had become a black uh, community. And so by the middle of the 60s, this is before Sarah was born, we, we were um, sort of being sent around to different schools to desegregate them. I mean, basically, that's what it was. And uh, I had a summer program, was part of a summer program, where we were sent up to the northern suburbs, to a suburb called Winnetka, which was another world for me. Uh, there were maids. In fact, the maids came from my community and they, they went up with us. They were on the same train to go to Winnetka. And, you know, they would ask us, I remember one of them, beautiful woman, she said, baby, what are you, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to summer school. She said, you coming to school up here? I said, yeah. And she said, she just beamed. She said, well, that's, that's wonderful. Of course, that was a that was Sarah's community. I mean, she wasn't she wasn't alive at the time. She wasn't on Earth, but but that was another world for me, where um, we had to deal with gangs. We had to deal with you know not overtly, but you know they were there and police police brutality and all of that. And this community had lawns and there was the lake because I was brought up uh, not to go to the lake to learn to swim because uh, the lake had segregated beaches and my mother was afraid for us to go because she didn't want us to go the wrong side of the beach. I mean, where um, the beach existed, where Sarah was family lived was racially segregated. So we gone there, we could get hurt. So I never saw the lake. Um, I saw pictures of it, 
but I never saw the lake because we didn't go to the lake. Yeah. And I saw it in Sarah's community for the first time. I remember because, you know, you talk about Lake Michigan, but Lake Michigan is a great lake and it looks like the sea. And I can remember how huge, this huge sort of arc of water, which I wasn't allowed to see. So that that's that's my story in relation to Sarah and Sarah's in relation to me. I mean, and it's so, it's just so, it's it's really amazing, you know, because I mean, I grew up, so I grew up in Winnetka and I went to the school that you were bussed up to go to. My grandmother had a black maid who bussed up from the South side um, or trained up exactly the ways that you're talking about. Our families intersected like that. It wouldn't surprise me at all if, you know, you rode up on the train with my grandmother's Probably maid true. because she had yeah. a maid in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so, and my mother and aunt were going to Nutrier, which was the high school at the same time. So this is, these, these stories are so interconnected. And I grew up with the lake on my doorstep every day. I walked to the lake every single day and I never thought about it. And it wasn't until I studied American history that I learned that the Chicago race riots in 1919 had started because of exactly what you said, because a black boy in a heat wave floated across an invisible barrier in Lake Michigan to the wrong beach and was stoned to death in the water and he drowned and it started a race riot as That's you right. might expect it would. That's right. Um, and it was, and it's learning that kind of stuff where you realize how history actually works in America and how racial and economic segregation actually work and how hard it is to break that stuff down, how structural it is. And it Very helps you understand so. why the Biden Kamala conversation about his, his relationship to busing and segregated schools was such an inflammatory issue for so many people because this is everybody's own lives. This isn't history. This is the lives of people watching them. This is people like you knowing what it was like to be have rocks hurled at you as you were trying to go to a decent school. And that's why this stuff is so urgent and so living. Um, clearly, we could keep doing this forever, um, as we warned at the top, but we do want to give people a chance to... Um, to ask some questions. So, yes. and if no questions come in, we'll just keep talking. Cause we'll keep talking. Um, but that's um, easy for let, us. Exactly. As everybody I think can tell. Um, but let me see uh, what we've got here. Um, okay. So um, questions from, oh, actually a couple of the questions are about whether we think that um, even if Trump goes, that Trumpism will remain. My short answer to that is yes, but I'll uh, I'll let you elaborate on that or have a different opinion. Um, well, you know, as you know very well, Sarah, because it's part of your your scholarship, Trumpism is a moment in time from a long, long arc of things. Yeah. Um, and he didn't invent would, it, and he's not going to end it. <laughs> he's not going to end it. Um, you know, it, it does go back. Uh, this the United States erupted in a civil war, and I want to stress that. Um, and the Civil War was about a different point of view of the United States, what it is. That's how it erupted. It never ended. It never ended. So it pops up it, from time to time, and this is a latest iteration of it. Um, and it has to do a, a, a lot of how people see the country. And until we get Frankly, I, I think this is a passing thing. I'm not going to see it pass, but I think it will pass because I think the country is becoming more educated. I think the country is becoming more integrated. This is also a huge demographic shift. I don't know. Um, I mean, I have, I have kids in my family, uh, nieces and nephews, great nieces and nephews who have blonde hair. I mean, this is disappearing in my own family. And this is not unusual. Um, Kamala Harris's family is a blended family. This is not unusual stuff. We're seeing a shift of, of the demographic shift and this is probably their last hurrah. That's for sure. Now what's coming after that, I can't say, but there, it is the last hurrah of a demographic shift. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a question that's um, uh, directed at you, and I'm going to slightly expand it because it relates to one of the things um, I was going to ask you as well, which is um, I've heard some historians positing um, the idea that 
um, as we had uh, reconstruct, basically, so we had a period called reconstruction, as I don't have to tell you, but for the audience, um, after the Civil War, which was this really radical experiment in mixed race government. Um, which you know they tried to do in the in the slave South, which is kind of amazing when you stop and think about it. That they tried to go from racial slavery to mixed race government. Um, it's, so it's always one of the moments in a weird way that gives me hope. Um, and then many people would say that the civil rights movement with Dr. King was a second reconstruction. And I've heard people suggest that we're now in a third reconstruction, but it's led by black women for the first time, because of course the BLM movement is led by women. Stacey Abrams getting the vote out in Georgia, the way that, that um, African-American women got Joe Biden the primary and then turned out the vote just now and clearly carried it um, for Biden. So the, the question that was put in the Q&A is what what do you think the next stage of the American experiment is, which is a more open-ended question. Um, I think, but I want to think about this idea of, there, of us um, entering another reconstruction. I, I think the next stage of the American experiment will be, as you say, uh, America is becoming, I mean, I don't believe in using the term race because we're the human race, but I'll use it in the political sense so that we, we all know what we're talking about. Uh, the country has changed. Um, what the Republican Party tried to do um, <clears throat> when Barack Obama was elected president was change the electorate. So that's really what's been happening since 2008, at least, is just suppress the vote, just change the electorate. I mean, don't let this happen again, but it can't be stopped. So the and next suppressing the vote is an old American um, exactly it's an old <laughs> thing too exactly I mean my father couldn't vote unless he could read Mandarin Chinese as a poll test in Mississippi <laughs> and this is true so oh, the, the, yeah this, this really happens so uh, we're going to go into uh, uh, an era and it's going to take a long time uh, but we're going we're moving into a time when uh, Kamala Harris and all of this and Barack Obama is not going to be any big deal. Young people know that, uh, kids already know that. This is about a generation, it's my generation and a little bit younger who are trying to hold on to something that's just going away. And it's sort of sad to look at because, um, it's very sad to look at because these are frightened people. These are people who live in areas of the United States. If you look at the map of the United States now, when you can see blue and red, red are the Republicans, blue is uh, the Democrat, you can see in the middle of the country, which is largely more rural than the coast, really what this demographic shift is. There are a lot of people in that part of the United States who have never ever encountered a person of color before or an LGBTQ person or, uh, there was one woman actually that was quite amazing to me. And she was very, um, she said, the reason I like Joe Biden, she said, but I'm not going to vote for him because I just don't think two women should be running things, i.e. Nancy Pelosi and Kamala Harris. And she said, I know I'm a woman. I know what I'm saying, but I just don't feel good about that. These are the kind of things that are going to be unearthed and are going to be talked through and worked through. And I'm optimistic about it. Um, again, Trump has tested the norms of the American experiment almost to destruction, but he hasn't destroyed them because even as horrible as it was, when Trump got 70 million votes. People came out to vote. They voted. They believed that this system of voting was gonna get them what they wanted. So they came out and I felt gratified by that. People didn't hit the streets, people didn't walk around saying it's not gonna work. They showed up, this was the biggest number of votes cast ever in America. Yeah, and that makes yeah. me happy. And the highest turnout by percentage in a century. Exactly. Uh, which is, so there's a lot of good news in there as well, absolutely. Um, there's um, a question um, related to this, and then we'll transition to some other um, aspects of the situation. But um, the question is, what did you personally make of Biden's comments in his uh, victory speech that the African-American community had on election day and that he recognized that and he was going to honor it? He seemed to be quite, uh, he was quite moved and he seemed to be quite passionate about that. Um, what did, how did you read that? What did that mean to you? Well, remember uh, Jim Clyburn, uh, Clyburn, uh, Democrat of North Carolina and one of the leaders of the House. I remember the day when he said to North Carolina before they went to vote in the primary, they said, you have to choose Joe Biden. Joe Biden has always been there for us. And that's who you have to choose. Mm -hmm. 
And that really got black women who, African-American women who are the ones who go and ring the doorbells and have the teas and do the licking and all that stuff and, and do the telephone calls, got them going. And so they then began to energize everybody else like Stacey Abrams, who I think registered personally 800,000 people in Georgia to vote. So um, what Biden was, what Jim Clyburn was saying was that there wasn't one moment, not one moment of the eight years that Joe Biden was vice president to Barack Obama, that he betrayed him, that he looked as if he wasn't on board, that he looked as if he was trying to undermine him or do him in or talk behind his back. There wasn't one second. And we, as black people are very sensitive to that. So if we had seen a second of Joe doing that in our presence, that would have been the end of it. Joe never did. And he said in his speech, he said, you've always had my back to black people. And he said, I'm gonna have yours. And there is no higher accolade that he could have done than to bring on board a black woman as his deputy. And he, that was the highest honor that he could have shown to us. I don't know how all is gonna work out, but what he did was was so important. And, and uh, that's all you can ask from a politician is that they just put, put, the, put their, their own honor and their own, their own principles and incarnate them in what they do. And that's what Joe has done so far. Absolutely. Um, there are a couple of questions um, about the education divide between the Democrats and the Republicans uh, at the moment, and the question about um, really whether the Republicans are going to increasingly not just be the party of, of uh, rural whites, but of the white working class, which you know has historically been the Democratic, um, uh, the white working class also uh, voted for Democrats for the last half century or so. Um, and so the, but also a question here about, about, you know, what, what can we do with education or, um, to try to redress this or maybe bring the country back together is something I think about a lot, um, is, is there is a failure of education there, um, for these kinds of divides to happen and for this propaganda, uh, um, to, to take hold and for these conspiracy theories to take hold. And there is, there are issues there clearly, um, but they're not simple and they're not easily addressed. Um, what's your yeah. What's your view about the role of education in all of this? You, you know, I always say to um, people, young black people especially, my generation, I mean, you didn't get into Harvard if you were black just by your intelligence in the old days, you just didn't get in. It didn't matter what how smart you were. It didn't matter if you public, you know, passed your SATs. You didn't go to Yale. You didn't go to Barnard. These are the Ivy League equivalent of Oxford and Cambridge in in the United Kingdom. You didn't get in there. Your intelligence didn't matter. So what my generation did was we demanded that we have an education. We demanded that we be allowed to go to Harvard and be allowed to go to Yale. Now, some of us didn't get in, but what Harvard and Yale did uh, around the end of the 60s and the 70s was extend out. And the federal government made it possible. If you allow, you, 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 know, you did affirmative action, if you reached out to the black community, then we will, we will give you extra funding. We'll help you to, 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 to accommodate this. So what happened, and what's happening, and it's a good thing, but it really needs to be looked at. There is a meritocracy. There is an elite. There is, and Michelle and Barack epitomize it. These are people who, because they're intelligent and they passed the test, they were able to go to Harvard Law. That never happened before. So people are now uh, highly educated, um, and, and thank goodness they are. But this was hard fought. And I think sometimes the younger generations don't understand that they just didn't get there by the grace of their brains. We had to fight for them to get in there. And I think sometimes people don't really understand that there, there was a demographic who couldn't send their kids to school. I mean, if you were a white rural person, how did you get your kid into that affirmative action program? You know, it was so rough and so hard and so tough to get 
to open up these universities and these elite spaces for African Americans so damn hard that the focus was on us just being able to break those barriers. And these kids on these white kids on the farm, what about them? Nobody, the space wasn't there. We could not imagine that because you had a Southern accent and you grew up in Poughkeepsie, whatever, you maybe you couldn't get into Yale too, but we, it was so much going on. I think in some ways that couldn't be taken on board. And of course they were being worked on by Richard Nixon and, 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 and America first and all this kind of thing, which Trump reiterates. So now you, you got a situation where you got a generation of, of African-American uh, young people who are looking for what they're supposed to have. And I would say to them, this was hard fought and it is not natural that you have it. It was fought for. And the other side of that equation, all those white working class kids who couldn't, didn't, and he couldn't. And Donald Trump preys on that demographic. Mm -hmm. He preys on the demographic of Chinese American kids who couldn't get in because they didn't fit the criteria. He preys on the demographic of Native American kids who couldn't get in. So in the, in the, in the, in the haste to rectify a big fat wrong and something that was not a wrong, it was unconstitutional. We didn't do what Dr. King said. We didn't do what FDR said, a rising road meets everybody. We didn't rise the road. Yeah. So now we're weeping the whirlwind. And I think I mean, I don't think education is the answer to everything, frankly, even though I'm for education, I don't think that makes you a person. It makes you capable of being one, but it doesn't make you a human. Uh, being human is what we're doing now. We're talking to each other. We're talking across generations to each other. We're talking across demographic. We're talking across everything to each other. We're in the same community. We live in the same space, but we live in a different space as well. I can get to your place. I can call to your place in 20 minutes, <laughs> but we live in another space. Okay. So I think we missed something. I didn't because I was too young to, but my parents did because it was such an emergency. Racism was such an emergency. But we left behind some people too. And that's got to be cleaned up. That's got to be cleaned up. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. Um, we're going to have to wrap up in a second, but I want to make one last um, um, point about this because I think we need to have a little bit of, of look to the future. Um, yes. So there are a couple of questions about what a Biden presidency might look like if the Senate retains its majority um, with a rigged slash hostile uh, Supreme Court. Now, even questions like that beg the question of what's going to happen in that January 5th runoff in Georgia. And I'm sure that um, people who are uh, caught up enough on the American election to want to watch this um, event with us are aware that um, the Senate uh, race hangs in the balance on January 5th. But let's assume for the sake of argument that we don't take the trifecta. Um, if we take the trifecta, the whole game changes, baby. And Absolutely, we'll have a totally, different totally. conversation in January totally. about this brave new world. Totally. But let's assume for the sake of argument that McConnell, I'm not going to swear, I've made it all this way through without swearing. McConnell always makes me swear. Um, that McConnell clings on and um, and that indeed Biden has uh, a, a hostile Senate and a uh, hostile Supreme Court. Um, how much room do we, but I'll pass this to you, think that, um, but we do need to keep it uh, brief, just give me like one or two sentences on wh what you think Biden might be able to achieve. Okay, I'm going to be blasphemous and say, don't write off Amy Coney Barrett. Don't assume. Don't make an assumption. Okay, that's number one. Okay. Number 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 two, um, uh, let's say Mitch McConnell's got it. Um, I think, uh, first of all, uh, Joe's going to be ruling through uh, executive order uh, for about two years, and then it will flip over again because people will just be so exhausted. But he can work through executive order. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He can do yeah. a lot with the pandemic through executive absolutely. order. He can do a lot absolutely. of what needs to be done as Trump. Absolutely. Done. And it will be an international presidency. So we're going to see a lot of America re-engaged in the world. It's going to join the yeah. W, rejoin the WHO. Everything is going to go back yeah. to everything. And climate change, all of that. Go so back to all of it. 
He yeah. has a lot of power to do good. Even UNESCO with, um, uh, is going to go back. America will be back to Absolutely. all of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, so a Biden presidency is good news. However, we shake it up and we don't need to be all, I mean, obviously it would be better. Uh, uh, I know, so I just want McConnell to sit in the Senate as minority leader and just have to lose and lose and lose. Well, you know, if that count is going <laughs> like it is, what, what, again, just quickly, what people don't understand about the demographic shift, Georgia is an example. The suburbs of Georgia and the and the and the suburbs of Georgia that have a lot of research centers and the suburbs of Atlanta are the one that drove this. They're going to do it again. Okay, absolutely, Stacey Abrams is going to get that vote out. And vote I is going to happen again. It, it's demographic. It's mathematics. It. It's mathematics. It's going to happen absolutely. again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, on that extremely positive note, um, I need to um, thank you very much, Bonnie, for that. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, which I really enjoyed. I need to um, just have a couple of uh, notes in, in closing for our uh, audience. Please, um, can we ask you to complete the evaluation form, which is in the chat um, to your side. There should be a link there. Um, it'll also be circulated by email. It's really important for us. Um, it helps us ensure that the festival events remain free. Um, and that we can continue to improve. So um, please do take a couple of minutes to fill those out. It's incredibly valuable to us. If you'd like to, speaking of supporting the festival, you should also feel free to make a donation. Um, there is a, a link on the festival website under support us. And um, I, I don't tell anybody what kinds of circumstances we're all operating in. You'll be amazed to hear that humanities festivals are not a top funding priority under this government. So any help that you can give us would be um, much appreciated. The festival runs from today until the 22nd of November and some events still have spaces which you can book on our website. Um, and the majority of them you can attend from the comfort of your own home and be visiting all kinds of different places across the UK. So Sarah, can uh, I say something quickly? Please, please. Conversation, and that's what Hartwig Fisher and I are holding at the British Museum. Conversation is our purview as human beings. This is what we do. We know how to talk to one another. And in talking to one another and engaging one another in conversation and looking at each other as the same species, the, the, the leaps and the arcs that happen just in doing that are crucial, not only to us continuing as a species, but in respecting other species on this earth too. It is important that we be human. It's the most important thing. Well, thank you very much. I have a feeling that we're going to be clipping that, Bonnie, and possibly putting it on our website with your permission, because it's exactly what we think. It's absolutely the ethos of the festival. Um, one final note that there will be um, another event on Monday the 16th at the same slot, another In Conversation event, when I'll be in conversation with um, the wonderful writer Kit DeWall about diversifying the literary canon and how we judge literary quality, another um, subject that, um, that Bonnie and I have talked about lots of times, but we won't do that um, tonight. So um, it just remains for me to thank you again, Bonnie, for that. Um, I hugely thank enjoyed you. it. I hope everybody else did too. And um, I mean, I'll see you before January 5th if, if this lockdown thing opens up, but um, if Definitely. not- Definitely, we, um, we know where we, we're we, meeting too. We <laughs> we right, exactly. On January 5th. Absolutely, exactly. absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.